Hey there peoples, do the Dutch here and I'm here to make a little video that I came up with a subject that I've had in my mind for just about a day. Maybe half a day. And I decided to create it. But before we get started, I'd like to put out that this is how I think that things are within the world of Warcraft, which is the subject I'm going to be talking about. A specific subject, which I will mention of course in a few moments. So before we do anything, this is how I think that it is with uh, best set the classes and a certain energy that they have to their disposal, but it's their, their power. So before we get into this, I'd like to put out that this is how I think it is. I may be completely wrong, I might be right. It can go either way, so please do not chastise me or send me death threats if I might be wrong. And uh, don't praise me as a god if I'm right, okay? Just putting it out there. So before, so let's just get to it. So let's talk about World War. More specifically, magic. Now, as we all know, there's a lot of magic. More specifically, of course, we see it ourselves and use it as classes. Now, there's, of course, different sources of power as magic to these classes. It's all different, but the question is, where does it come from and how do we actually draw upon it or however we use it? So... As we might as well just get started, we'll get to the one that is actually quite well known among several races across all of Azeroth and even to different worlds, such as Outland, also known as Draenor, which is priests. So, let's talk about priests. Now, priests call upon something called the Light. Now, as we all know, there are two types of priests, though. There are Light and Shadow. Though Shadow is still very much, without a pun intended, the dark, though it's clear that we draw upon it, but it's a much more darker. But where it actually comes from, we st I don't know, actually. I don't know, but it might be because of maybe it has something to do with light. And the light is something that priests call upon. They call upon it as a sort of being to protect them or strike at their enemies. That's how they actually use it. But it's actually also different per class because but actually not per class but per race because it actually acts very strange because for example as, as humans we believe the light is just a, s a sort of energy a force that we can call upon to aid us yet within night elven society they praise upon the moon a loon the goddess of the moon and it's actually moonlight that they call upon. Then there is even a more stranger thing is that, of course, we think that the light is a sort of force of justice, of righteousness. Yet we've seen actually beings that have quite evil intentions draw upon it. Now, you might also think it's also something that is only native to Azra. But we've actually seen that the light can be drawn upon from other worlds. So it's clearly not something on Azra, but something universally. It's, we don't know what it is, we've seen that there's actually physical manifestations, but the, the point is, priests call upon the light. They, in a way, pray to it, they ask it for guidance to protect, as protection, and as a weapon to, to strike at their enemies. Now, next up on the list is another being that draws upon the light, which is Paladins. It's the same nature, but a little different. Instead, they draw it inward, they focus it inward as a strength, as something to enhance their power, to protect them as well. But the nature of it is still the same, they call upon it. So paladins call upon it in the same way the priests do. But as we've seen, it can actually also in a way be harnessed as a power, though we don't understand exactly how that was utilized. For example, we know that with the, with the Blood Elves who actually captured a living Naru and drew its life, its light, out of it. And somehow we were able to harness it. So it's a very, to be honest, almost elusive force that is not actually like choosing a side. It seems to just aid whoever they, it actually thinks just calls upon it. Which is strange, but very mysterious. And in Warlords of Draenor it should be cleared up a little bit about what the light now actually really is. Now, the next one is another fighter of a, of a certain description. Now, of course, some people will say this might stretch the bit of magic, but it's, it's a source of power that is not necessarily purely a physical strength, which is Death Knight. 
And as we should know, Death Knights draw upon runes, which are magical emblems that they... We don't actually know where they hold them. It's said to be on their blades, so it's a source of magic that is purely actually in a way necrotic, which is a dark form of magic. It's still not completely clear how it's used. It's definitely a form of shadow magic. But they draw upon it, but we also know that Death Knights will, of course, hold runic power. Now, this is energy that is released in the use of these runes. These runes are utilized, and somehow a Death Knight draws power from that, and then is able to use that as a form to strike at their enemies directly with powerful energies of necrotic power, or powerful necrotic-infused or ice-infused strikes that they use upon their enemies. Now, that's a very strange... that's strange, but I say that is more magic than physical strength. It's actually a bit of a combination of both, which can also be found within the Paladins. So I'd say that it's still a bit similar, but just, uh, let's say, the practice of it is a bit different. Now, next up is, of course, Druids. This is a bit the same thing. Now, as we should know, Druids call upon the force of nature to aid them in combat, but they are also capable of very strange capabilities. They are also in tuned to very much everything that is involving nature, not just plants, but also animals, and even the sky, and even is actually reacting to them. The stars and moon and sun actually are called upon. And once again, Druids call upon this. They ask nature and the sun and moon to aid them in combat and to protect their allies and to harm their foes. It's similar once again, and as we've seen, it's capable of allowing them to do a great deal of things, which is allowing them to call upon magical beings of nature, such as tree ants to aid them to entangle people in roots, even it allows them to shapeshift themselves into anim powerful animals, which allow them all sorts of things. Now, next, this is showing, of course, a lot of what actually nature is all encompassed by and that is quite impressive so once again as I like to put it druids call upon nature it, but unlike other forces though it is of course capable of actually being enslaved partially as we have seen with Mfandral Staghelm's Druids of the Flame these are actually ones who have twisted nature to their cause through fire actually it is a very twisted form. This is, of course, something that involves strong mental dominance. And instead of calling upon it, they actually grasp it by the neck. If you want to put it into a sort of physical representation, they grab them by the neck and force them to do what they do. Now, the next one is actually one that uses a bit that can also be utilized in both that ways, which is the shamans. Now, shamans are those who are deeply in tune with actually a spirit world, but not just those of the dead but also with those of the elements, which is, of course, earth, fire, water, and air. Now, they can call upon spirits from these ele respected elements to aid them in battle, once again, just like many of the other magic users. This can once again be utilized in both harming enemies, but also aiding their allies. Now, this is, of course, shown in a very strange way, because unlike most of the others, Shamans draw upon something that is actually not just only in a physical representation, but truly intelligent, and even chooses sides. But, uh, because there's a form of almost like societal structure within these forces of nature, these spirits, this is actually what they draw upon. They ask them, and they actually use... You might be wondering, how do they do this? This is where actually the totems come in. These spirits don't actually exist truly like in a physical form within the physical realm. These, they are not attuned to our world. They live within their elemental planes. And there's actually a sort of sometimes separation between them. So they create special magically infused objects known that we know as the totems to anchor them into that world. But as we also know, shamans can be into two different varieties. We ourselves are those who call upon the elements but there are others who are called Dark Shamans. Now these, once again, are very, very dangerous. They actually do not call upon the elements to aid them. They enforce them. They enslave them. They twist them. Torture them until they do no... until, their will, until the will of the Shaman 
is completely enforced upon these elements. Now these elements are twisted and turned into horrible things. They turn water becomes like sl poisonous sludge. Air is like toxic. Fire is almost empty. It's not life. It is purely meant to ravage everything and even the earth is just dry and it's almost well, fragile actually although it is completely enforced by these dark shaman but these element but we need to understand one thing about shamans and other things these shamans can of course enforce can force elements to aid them but unlike with most of the other powers that we have seen it can turn against them and we have seen before how certain shaman who abuse what they have those allies that they have and eventually, these elements will turn against them. So as it is, shamans actually wield a power that is, or better said, they call upon a power that can turn on them in any moment. Because actually, but the elements don't really ask much depending on what you, which one you summon. As their level power can differ. Basically, those who are actually simply are requesting that you respect them. Do that, and you will grant their aid disrespect the elements and you will feel their wrath. Now we go to the two last magic users that we are familiar to play as ourselves, which is of course the f are those who actually call upon no magic. They do not call upon it. The first one we talk about is mages. Now we all know that the other classes, except for death knights, can call upon the force, the great power that they use against their foes. But mages do not call upon this. They have learned to actually pick magic out of thin air. Now, the origin of mages actually started back on different worlds, but the one that we know is that it was drawn from a source of power known as the Well of Eternity by the Highborn. But over time, after the destruction at the end of the War of the Ancients, that source of power was lost, but the power, the magic, still existed within the world. It was only no longer just focus. It was spread. It was actually always spread, but the Highborn didn't know it. Those who learned that were able to wield that power. This is a very different form because it's actually a purely natural thing. It's like water flowing, but it is a very energetic power. It allows those who can wield it can actually do amazing things. It is actually something that can be molded into almost anything. This is shown by the mages that we play. They can meld it into an element of fire or ice. They can even be so much focused. This is what actually is all about mages. It's about learning to focus. You, they can, we cannot see it as the characters that we play, but I can imagine that the mage sees like flows of energy across the world that they can then start weaving with their hands and it is drawn to them and then they form it into something and direct it at their enemies. It can even go as far as that it can use it to physically affect the physical world. We have seen this in the form of spells such as polymorph which allows them to turn living beings into different beings altogether though we don't understand the full application of it. But they can also actually form things out of thin air such as we've seen for refreshment or even small objects like a table full of refreshment. So of course, uh, we've even seen it go as far as it can accelerate other people. It is unimaginable what can be done more. Cadgar specifically is already shown within the Warlords of El Warlords Alpha that he's able to create objects or just do it himself. He can actually turn back time partially. It is shown, this is something of course of the power that the uh, bronze dragonflight shows. So, in a way, you could say there is a connection between the magic that, for example, is mastered by the blue dragonflight as well as the one that is being used by the bronze dragonflight. Now, as we know, this is the energy that is used, but there is more of that sort of energy. Now, arcane is still quite a bit unstable, but it is still flowing. But there is an even more powerful one. These are practiced by those by or well, so one were one's mages. This is of course by mages who have seen all that Arcane has to offer that they can draw upon from there. But they are not yet done. They draw upon even further on magic. 
they go beyond what is allowed by their teachers. They go to the forbidden arts. They go to the form energies of fell energy. Now, fell energy is, is similar to arcane, but it is a form of chaos. It is pure chaos. This is what warlocks are. They are mages who wanted to gain more power, not necessarily for evil benefits, as most people believe. They are simply those who seek knowledge beyond what people believe should be allowed. Mages are in a way you could say like mages that warlocks are actually in a way you could say mages that turn to a sort of dark side. In ways we have seen what warlocks can do. They are incredibly powerful. They draw upon a, an energy that doesn't exist on a world. It exists in an entirely different realm that we know as the twisting nether which is nether magic which is fell magic and better known which is a chaotic magic, but they are able to actually draw this magic from this world and then direct it at their foes, most commonly known in the forms of the horrible afflictions that they cause, or just pure energetic and almost completely chaotic fire that can basically combust anyone into, that can just make anyone burst into flames. But they also still keep a bit of that mage of themselves. Now this is not just, they are even capable of drawing beings. Now this has also been seen with mages, those specifically who have learned the force of ice, who have been able to learn how to control a water element, which is strange because as far as we know, this is weird, but I'm getting a little bit of topic, but I'm just getting that a little bit out of the way because that was something I always found weird. As we know, a water elemental is still a living, thinking being. So how can a mage all of a sudden bind this to his will and command it? I would imagine that that water elemental is either a very friendly figure, or it is physically formed, or it's literally water physically formed through arcane magic, or it is actually being kept against its will. But this is back to the point that I wanted to come to with Warlocks, which is one of their most unique features, summoning. Just like they can draw upon magic from, for example, the Twisting Nether, they can actually draw the beings of the Twisting Nether, which are the demons, into our world and actually keep it controlled. This is done through pure force of will. This shows actually how powerful Warlocks really are already by a mental level. It's, but they still actually hold on onto certain things that we know already from them, such as their ability to actually manipulate the physical world through their energy, through the energy that they possess, the power. We've seen this, of course, in a more... They believe that they can do it in a more forced application. For example, take Polymorph from the Mage. Now, they are capable of turning a strong, powerful enemy into a helpless little critter such as a sheep. As we see, they are capable of doing abilities similar to a sheep, which is basically nothing. Now, Warlocks took that little application and decided, why would I turn something else into something harmless if I could turn myself into something even more powerful? This is what I think came to the idea of being metamorphosis. Now, we of course know that the Demon Hunter was the one who learned this through acquiring energy from the demons, but this might be the same idea that the warlock came to, but instead of, you know, draw, of acquiring some sort of object that allowed, he simply drew enough of this fell magic and formed it around himself, physically transforming him into a being of a demon. Now, as we should know, with Polymorph, they change into a sheep, but I don't think that they are a sheep. Their, their physical form is simply transformed into this, but those individuals who are turned into this being still hold their original mind. They are still in that intelligent being, but you can't really harm anyone as a sheep. Now, the warlock took the same application, but turned himself into the rather than turning him into an animal, he turned himself into a powerful demon. But he still retained his intelligence, his own mind, instead of becoming a powerful, bloodthirsty demon. Now, even more applications of what is shown that they still hold on to some of their, let's say, mage abilities are their conjuration. Now, as we know, mages can conjure up refreshments like food and water and even a table full of it. Now, the warlock took that application and stirred in a little bit of fell magic, creating objects such as stones that can restore your health or even store souls in order to return to their body if their body would, if they would ever die. 
they take that same application of, let's say, altering the physical world or adding something to it and spice it up a little bit. They take what mages learn and go even further. Now that's what I think is quite interesting. Now of course the subject of mages of warlocks is always interesting. And that's what I like about something that I always liked about World of Warcraft. The source of power where they draw it from. Now this is of course put into a lot of these today, let's say current day fantasy worlds or universes. They show a way how you gain this power. Whether it's called upon or harnessed in some way. That it is, you know, grasped about. That they truly just draw upon it from some sort of realm. This is, of course, something I like. So that's basically what I think how the sources of power that, you know, the classes within World of Warcraft who use magic simply call it upon. So that's basically it. That is everything I had to say. Hope you enjoyed it, and if you're ever interested in anything more like this, please leave a comment below the video, and I'll see you guys next time.